from the standpoint of eerie comics yeah. <clears throat> and science fiction, again, my, my main family was Avon. And that was my rock. And I went back and forth. And when I wasn't doing comics for them, I was doing uh, paperback covers. Them. And then they ran, I'd forgotten this, they experimented for about three issues of Avon Science and Fantasy Fiction. It was a, it was a very th thinner than a paperback, a little bit larger in format, maybe a, a square a kind of shape, but bigger than a paperback, definitely smaller than a comic book. So maybe five by seven, and they had about six stories, each illustrated with a pen and ink, and a, generally it was a sort of dolly-like abstraction on the front cover. <clears throat> and they ran about three issues, uh, because what, what they were doing a lot between Saul and Mr. Myers was trying to tap the market, what was selling, what wasn't. And the, uh, I think it's fair to say, and possibly, and possibly accurate, that the paperback people stayed with paperbacks, the comic book people stayed with comic books, but Avon moved between all of them. And I don't think they're, Avon Science Fiction, there was, I got a letter from a man, um, a couple of, oh, maybe 15 years ago named John Jakes. John Jakes at one point was the biggest selling paperback author extant. He had written the North and South trilogies. Of course. And he said to me, he wrote to me and he said, you illustrated one of my first stories. I was a student at college and I sent a story into to Avon and they published it in their science fiction and fantasy and I said I would, I wonder if you would know where any of those original pen and inks were. And I sent him one. I had two of them. I got them my originals. That was another thing. Avon always gave me my originals back. I couldn't get my originals That's back incredible. from anybody. They gave you the originals? Yeah. Um, it, almost unheard of. Well, that was why I stayed with them. Wow. I didn't, I didn't want the pages of the comic books. I wanted the, 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 the pen and inks. Yeah. yeah. I went out with Jim Vandermont Court of Science to the San Diego Comic Con, and we sold, we sold about 15 of them for about 1500 dollars each. Um, I kept, I've only got, I don't think I've got maybe more than one left, mm -hmm. plus one. I've got the page from Kenyon of the Star Patrol, the original um, inside cover of that. Wow. It was the best swipe of Alex Raymond ever done. I should have been sued. It was terrible. <laughs> but I didn't get caught. Uh, so I, I, what I was going to say also is what I used to do a lot was I would buy these movie stills of, uh, what's that one, the one on the left? Yeah, this That's is the one I own. I've still got that one. Really? Yeah. Oh man, I'd love to take a photo of it. If, if, well, if you have it. No, I don't have it here, it's in oh, Connecticut. I, I, but if you want to write me and I'll send you a high res. Two -headed the two-headed dragon. dragon. Kind of thing. I think that's in there, yeah, I'm not this sure. This is the one of which the cover. You did oh, was that the cover? Yeah, no, I this is not the cover. This no, is no, the... was that the cover with the two-headed dragon? two-headed dragon. <clears throat> yeah, I, I remember the cover. Okay. Okay, so that's the one that I, that I was talking about. And I don't was, have that. Yeah, that was a great one. Though. That, that's but this one, the one you're looking at on the left, that was a black and white. This is the interior. <clears throat> yeah. Right, exactly. I've got, I, I kept that one as my singular favorite. It's fantastic. Because it was my, I would call it my homage to, it, to Alex Raymond. It's, it's Alex Raymond. It's fantastic. It is, yeah. It's Thank you. Very much. Uh, it's got the... But most of the others we sold, I thought, you know, I was thinking at that time, Mike, uh, what am I going to do with all these? It's, it's, I, there was a man named Salazar who was in, I think, Pittsburgh. Last week sent me two Western comics, Wild Bill Hickok and Jesse James. I said, do you want me to personalize them? No, he said, I just want you to sign them. Don't personalize them. I guess he wanted to sell them, which is fine. But yeah. it's so long ago, um, I can look at it and see what I was like at a certain stage. But that's yesterday, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, have, I have one question. One yes. More question about. And I was going to ask you one, mention one more thing. One yeah. of the things I used to do a lot for the, anybody listening who's an artist, I used to buy a lot of these movie stills, and particularly for the horror ones, and they would, they would have shots of 
Oh, Warner Olin playing Charlie Chan with a light from underneath. Yeah. And John Carradine playing uh, something sinister. And I'd buy those, and I'd use a lot of those in those little pen and inks. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so you're using them. Yeah. Lon and, Chaney and right. Hunchback and, of Notre Dame. And well, let me ask you something about, for instance, with, with most of these, with the incredible line art that you did. See, that uh, was also, baby, one more thing, technically. Yes. That was probably one of the very few I did straight brush and no pen. This is brush. That's brush. All the others were pen. Oh, the, like, for instance, that. That's pen. That's pen and ink. This is brush and ink. Yeah. So there, there's a, that's a big thing. So uh, basically for Erie, you would use pen and ink for the interior. No, I think I used pen and ink for all of them, the westerns and everything. Oh. I just, on this one, but for, because yeah. it was more, it was a, my, my, sort of my tribute to Alex Raymond. Strange World's number six was yeah. brush and ink. That was Avon, I'm sure. It, yes, that was Avon. That was Avon. So uh, is there, is there actually, this brings up a, a side question. Is there any... Uh, advice you would give to comic artists today? Oh no, there's no advice because you cannot, it's a totally different genre, it's a totally different era, and um, I, I happen to believe the three things that mean a lot to me in art, and I've, for the last 50 years, have been basically painting mm -hmm. portraits a lot, lands yeah. landscapes, watercolors. The three areas that interest me the most, that's never changed. It's affected my taste in music, uh, from jazz to symphony. Yeah. I mean, I love Tatum. I love Brubeck. I love Rickard Strauss. Imagination. Feeling. And the means to communicate. That doesn't change. Uh, if you've got all three, that's as close to perfection as you can get. But the absence of any one of them does reduce the beauty. So what I'm saying is I would think that if I were, I remember years ago, I don't know if you remember the movie, Lawrence of Arabia, yes. one of the great movies, Peter one of the great performances. And I was drawing a sketch of Peter O'Toole. It was like 30, what, 35 years later. And here he was six foot two, weighing 120 pounds. He was, all his insides had been removed. He was alcoholic, his eyeballs were yellow. And he was smoking along. He was a great stage actor as well as a great movie actor. Yeah. But a great stage actor. Because I saw him in London and he was incredible on stage. And I said to him, if you had any advice to give a young actor, what would you tell him? He said, I'd tell him to learn his lines and learn the magic and beauty of language. And I would say, there's no substitute for working from life, from drawing from nature. and how it's going to come out, no one's going to know. I had no idea at the age of 16 I'd be a painter. But one thing I always loved was narrative. I loved storytelling. It, to this day, I think I'm a narrative painter, period. Mm -hmm. And that's why I can still relate and say that's where I come from. It's like Tony Bennett. You want to hear, appreciate him, you wouldn't realize what he's like when he's recording. And you watch him put a song together. And here he is, 92. And he's fortunate he's got his voice, but he's still out there. And his, his background is the big bands. Yes. Six shows a day. Yeah. No it's different. Incredible. Incredible. God. So advice, no, that, um, I, I, the only advice I, I would say is if you find something in art that you love to do um, and you can make your living, that's as close to an answer as there is. But those years were very important to me because it was storytelling, as it was with Tony with the big bands. And as I remember, I was telling someone last night about Sinatra. I said, did you ever see him live? Oh, no. Oh, and you never saw him. You got to see that guy out. He was a yeah. band singer. He was right in your face. I remember, do you remember the actor Jimmy Cagney? Yes. I knew him well wow. the last years of his life. I painted him and he retired. <clears throat> Uh, he had just had enough of movies. And he was really, in many ways, a song and dance man. Sure, he was known as a tough guy, but sure. Yankee Doodle was still, True. it was his favorite role. It was the epitome of everything he was. And uh, he came out of retirement because he was, his friends felt, you've you, you got to move your body a bit, Jimmy. You're getting too, 
atrophied. And so he came back and did one movie, Ragtime, and he was being interviewed all over the place. And I was with him when he was at a hotel suite one afternoon, and a gal from the Daily News said, you know, Mr. Cagney, he was in a very, very ancient 80, a diabetic. She said, I used to watch you in those movies and you'd have a little gesture with your shoulder and your snap your brim of your cap. And he said, where did you get all that from? Where did you learn all that? He said, I grew up on Manhattan on the streets. He used to be a pimp at the corner. And when he wanted a girl, he'd do this. And so-and-so used to run the slot machine. He'd do this with his hat. He said, you observe and you pick up a little here, you pick up a little there, and you get on with it. And that's the way it is as an artist. You pick up here, you pick up there, you live and you hopefully learn to communicate. Hopefully you have feelings. Uh, no, I, I think advice is easy to give, but I do think this. I think if you're an artist, it's very important that you um, restrict yourself and focus on the things you love and know. Otherwise, you're just a jobber. And I was a jobber. Mm -hmm. I said I love storytelling. So well, I didn't even care if it was a cowboy or a pretty girl or a detective or it was all storytelling. Yeah, it's true though, but aren't most artists jobbers? Well, you won't, exactly. Like even actors. I was about, about to say that's what an they, actor is. Yeah, you, you hear play this role. I was, I was painting this man this morning who was one of, the, one of the most important lawyers in New York. And I said, I said, how are you interpreting this? I don't know, I just see myself as an actor. It's not my, my job to say whether I like you or don't like you. Yeah. Why, did, why did everybody like Cagney when he was mean and nasty? There was something likable about him, something human. Right. I mean, he was There's nasty. Real about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's all it is. Connection. And that's what makes personality. Right. So the only advice is you do the. I, I would say this. Uh, I said to Miss Hepburn one day, Catherine. <clears throat> I said, well, Miss Hepburn, if you ever got a role and you didn't really get into it, or what, what did you do? And she went like this to me. She said, You do the best you can and you get on with it. Yes. That's about all you can do. Yeah. Best you can and get on with it. Yes. I mean. Do you have any, like, for instance, uh, we were talking about the computerization of comics now, nowadays, and the, 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 the very idea that artists rely on that to make their art look good. You pay a price. Ah. And the price is simple. If you don't use language, you don't learn to speak well. If you don't write letters, you're not going to learn to write well. Uh, if you don't draw from life and appreciate what nature can offer, you're missing a great deal. How often do people use uh, my daughter? Every other phrase is, you know, you know, or li they're language cop-outs. So if this is the way you, you want to speak and you're happy with a limited vocabulary, fine, but not for me. And so I'll go back to what O'Toole said, learn the magic and the beauty of language. Yeah. Learn the beauty of nature. <coughs> And, um, but it also, isn't it the hand connecting to the? the well, that I think that I I as I, I to doing this. I don't see it that much because that's a mechanical thing. Your hand does what your mind and heart tell you to. True. It all comes from here and here. But there's a skill. Well, but I I think I would hate to have to draw with my left hand, and I probably no, I probably would never be able to get at this age to learn it well enough. But let's say I'd lost the use of my right arm at 30. I'd be sitting here doing the same thing True. today. That's, that's, a, that's a mechanical thing. True. You can learn. You can adapt. I mean, if your eyes are taken from you and you can't see, the, like old flag at the end, poor, poor deer couldn't see anymore. Yeah. And that you couldn't give him back.